Today we are gathered here to talk about talkie talkie, also known as social interactions, and also erroneously referred to as role playing by so many people, including the person who made the thumbnail for this video. Yeah, they, they no longer work for me. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about how to have better social interactions in our D&D games, shall we? Number one, a social interaction should have a purpose. I know that lots of us love to talk in our special voices, do our little accents, talk like dwarves and high fluting elves. I have no idea how elves talk, but all dwarves talk with a Scottish accent, it is a proven and well-known fact. But the purpose of putting social interactions into your D&D game should not just be to give everybody an excuse to get in character and talk in their special voices and stuff. I mean, it's fun. If that's what floats your boat, then I guess you can, but then you have empty, meaningless social interactions that don't progress the plot, that don't really do anything super useful besides just do the next thing that I'm gonna tell you you shouldn't do, which is put social interactions into your games just to fill up the game session. You see, there's a thing that I think happens a lot of times in Dungeons and Dragons is that it is difficult to create a good adventure, a good location-based adventure with exploration, combat, encounters, a boss battle that's somewhat interesting. Designing adventures is kind of tough. It's not something that everybody knows how to do, but, social interaction scenes where there's an NPC and the players and we're just talking and talking and talking and talking for a long period of time. Well, that's pretty easy to design. That's pretty easy to put into the game session and fill up the time. So if you wanna just fill up time in your game session and you're not concerned about meaningfully progress the plot and have adventures that people go on, developing things that have a rising action, a climax and a falling action, your typical adventure design, your typical story design that we're telling stories around here. But if you don't care about any of that and you just wanna sit around and fill up game time with talkie talkie, well then you know, don't listen to me. It's really interesting. Sometimes I will watch D&D games on Twitch, live streamed D&D games and I notice that many of them have almost no combat. It's really just them sitting around having social interactions for most of the game. And there's part of me that thinks it's because it's a little lazy perhaps, and they don't want to design an adventure to go on and that it's just easier to do the talky talky bit. And then there's another part of me that wonders if they're just trying to copy a critical role and stuff because hey, let's try to get famous too, right? I don't know, I don't know. So. When you put a social interaction into your adventure, it should have a purpose, a goal. There should be a reason for it to be there. Something the characters can discover or obtain based on what they say and do. And how the dice roll, of course, because we are playing a game. For instance, if your players come upon a bunch of kobolds working in the kitchens who are slaves to the orcs, we all love a good kobold voice. Yeah, it's just really fun to talk like this and all of the players love it and everybody gets a kick and we all laugh and have fun and it's amazing. But wouldn't it be great if besides just talking in a cool voice, there was a purpose to those kobolds being there? Perhaps if the players are nice to those kobolds, the kobolds might return the favor and give them information about the orc compound. They might tell them where the orcs keep their treasure. They might tell them a little bit about the orcs boss, the big bad orc dude himself. That would be a purpose for that social interaction. So you get to do your talkie talkie, you have your special voices, but there is a purpose there is something the characters can accomplish there besides do their talkie talkie. Or if the characters are adventuring through a mansion trying to retrieve some special swords from Lord Klasovec, they might come upon the ghost of his slain lover. Now they could just fight the ghost and kill the ghost or they might talk to the ghost. They might have an interesting social interaction that results in the extraction of some information. If they promise to get revenge for her, justice for her, then she will tell them where to find Lord Klaskovac, or whatever he was, his sword collection, and maybe some of the weaknesses that he has. By the way, are you looking for new, intriguing adventures for your group to go on? Adventures set in a unique campaign world where a race of bird folk rules from the mystical tree city of Elderheart? Welcome to Humblewood Tales, a companion book to the Humblewood campaign setting for fifth edition, on Kickstarter now, but ending soon. Gather your party and embark on five new Humblewood adventures for levels three to eight, where you'll encounter pirate mercenaries, face off against 
against a Slime King, take on the Amerithian Kren in a nightmarish dreamscape, and much more. Brought to you by Hit Point Press, the Humblewood Tales Kickstarter is ending soon, so click that link below and check it out. Or about else, some of you are probably like, Luke, this is great, but I don't know what you mean by social interaction. I don't know what you mean by talkie talkie. And that's fair, and I would have defined it at the beginning of this video, but people hate it when I don't get right into the meat. And so I put the definition here. In essence, a social interaction is when the player's characters come across an NPC in the game. This could be a shopkeeper, a traveler on the road, or monsters that want to eat their faces off because yes, the monsters are NPCs too. And a conversation between the two parties results. That's it, that's a social interaction. Now folks will often speak in special voices or they'll call them accents, even though a lot of times they're not accents, they're just an odd, weird voice they came up with, which is cool. And in my opinion, superior to trying to replicate a real world accent. Even though dwarves are always going to talk like this, it's the rule. But you don't have to talk in special voices or accents during social interactions. You could just talk in your normal voice. You could talk in character if you wish, which means you're literally saying what your character is saying. And that's perfectly fine. No special voices or voice acting required because a lot of people don't feel comfortable doing it. A lot of people are bad at it. Some of you are leaving a comment right now saying that I suck at voice acting and I shouldn't quit my day job. Guess what, dude, this is my day job. Ha! Joke's on you! Okay, let's just move on to the next point. I just offended some people. Keep writing your comments. The YouTube algorithm loves your comment. Even if it's mocking me and making fun of me, I appreciate you. How many of these we gotta do? We gotta do 10 of these. We have to do 10 of these and I just got done with point one. I better speed this up. Number two, avoid pre-written word-for-word -word speeches. Nobody is gonna murderize you for doing this. Just literally taking out a piece of paper and reading a pre-written speech, a monologue or something to your players. But it is best avoided. It usually creates dry, uninteresting interactions between NPCs and characters, especially if it's a long monologue and basically an information dump. Instead, prepare just a few things in advance that will help you ad-lib and improvise the conversation at the table. In particular, the things that I find most useful are the NPC's motivations and goals and the NPC's ideals, bonds, and flaws. There's like four of them. What am I forgetting? Ideals, bonds, and flaws. What's the, what's the fourth one that I'm forgetting that NPCs usually have? You don't need an entire backstory for your NPC. Let me reiterate. You don't need an entire backstory for your NPC. But if you know the NPC's motivations, their goals, their bonds, their flaws, and their other things that I always forget, it is going to help you role play the NPC because all role playing an NPC is at the end of the day is deciding what the NPC says and does. And knowing those characteristics, knowing their motivations and goals, knowing their bonds is going to help you role play and decide what that NPC says and does. For instance, if I know that Strahd wants to test the characters, he wants to toy with them, he wants to see what they are made of, strength, courage, etc. If his goal is to find someone to replace him as Lord of Barovia, if that right person can be found, if his traits are that he is proud and narcissistic, and his bond is Tatiana, and his power, and his flaw is arrogance and overconfidence. If I know those things, I can better roleplay Strahd. I can better portray him at the game table. I don't need monologues from Strahd. I don't need pre-written speeches. I need some basic information that allows me to use my brain and roleplay. And if you do that, your interactions between your NPCs and your players' characters, that role play that happens at the game table in that particular social interaction scene is gonna be much more fulfilling, much more organic, much more interesting likely than if you were to read a pre-prepared speech. Number three, don't monologue. I kind of hit this a little bit in the last point, so we're gonna to try to keep this brief. Sometimes monologuing is when you're reading something aloud from a text from module. But it can also be when you, the DM, keep talking and talking and talking. Stop. Let your players participate too. Let it be a dialogue. Let everybody join in on the conversation. Except for the one player who yells attack and tries to cast Eldritch Blast. I mean, ignore that player, right? Let everybody else participate in an actual social interaction and just, just ignore that guy because there's always one of those guys, right? He can just wait and, and, and attack later, right? Who knows exactly what I'm talking about.
You want a conversation between the characters and NPCs. This back and forth makes it more interesting and engaging for everyone. No one wants to sit there and listen to you talk for five minutes. Number four, use bullet lists. This is a tool to help you avoid the pre-written word for word speeches that some people tend to use. Sometimes you do have things the NPC needs to tell the characters. It's important to the game or story and you don't want to forget. So write them out as bullet lists and then and as you're role-playing the NPC, have them bring up those points as organically as possible during the conversation. And you can literally be referring to the bullet lists and making sure that you're hitting all the points that you wanted to hit. And this is exactly what we do in Layer Magazine for our role-playing notes. We use simple bullet lists to provide guidance to game masters on how to role-play NPCs. Sure, bullet lists aren't as elegant as pros, but it sure makes the information easier to use at the game table. In fact, I would say that that is a defining trait of our publications, such as Lair Magazine. Not only do they contain lots of Dungeon Master resources to help folks reduce their prep time and run amazing games, but they are designed to be easy to use and reference during gameplay. We tend to believe in making Dungeon Master's jobs easier, not harder. Number five, use NPC starting attitudes. In the Dungeon Master Guide on page 244, it details that NPCs can have three different starting attitudes, friendly, indifferent, or hostile. Friendly means the NPC wants to help the characters and will help as long as it involves riskless tasks. That means there's no real danger to them. Indifferent it means the NPC might help or hinder, but they won't go out of their way to help, and they might refuse to help or decide to help depending upon their own goals. Hostile means the NPC opposes them, but doesn't necessarily mean they attack on sight. In the case of a hostile NPC, the party might need to succeed on one or more challenging charisma checks to convince them to do anything on their behalf. So the idea here is that through conversation and charisma checks, the characters can influence an NPC's attitude, either positively or negatively, and possibly convince them to do something for them. There is a conversion reaction table on page 244 that gives suggested DCs you can use for these checks. Now, saying the right things and making good charisma checks positively influences an NPC. Good charisma checks means rolling high, doing well on them, because some people, I don't know, they like to fail, and they're like, I rolled a nat one, woo! No, we're not talking about that. If you, if you like, take glory and your failures and how horrible you are, then that's not, that's not what I mean. There's nothing wrong with that, if, I suppose, but it would not talk, good means high. And saying the wrong things and failing charisma checks negatively influences an NPC. I would also suggest that if during this social interaction, a character hits on an ideal, bond or flaw that that NPC has, that might give them advantage on their charisma check or disadvantage depending on the circumstance. Or it might even automatically influence the NPC one way or another. By the way, if you're finding the information in this video useful or just find my ruggedly handsome face inspiring and don't mind that we're taking forever to get through these points, please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm down below. Let YouTube know that I don't suck, even though I'm taking forever here. Number six, remember that conversation and charisma checks are not all powerful. Look, there's there's just some things NPCs are just never going to do, no matter how convincing an argument is or how high a persuasion check is. I don't care if it's a nat 20, I just don't care. The royal guard with orders to let no one into the king's private chambers are not going to let you in. The, the, the nat 20. They don't care. Their orders are no, and some convincing little conniving squirt that comes along saying, oh, we need to go in there because X, Y, and Z. The Royal Guard is like, no, you're not going into the King's private chambers. They lower their halberd. Now, go away. The point here is that you still need to role play NPCs reasonably. They are real people in a real world. I mean, it's an imaginary real world and imaginary real people, but we're trying to create that verisimilitude where it feels like a real world and it feels like real people. Therefore, these real people in this real world should act like it. Number seven, use your voice and body language when role playing an NPC. Yes. You've made it into my inner sanctum. Congratulations. Now, let's dance. <laughs> Welcome, dearies, into my inner sanctum. You've made it quite a ways. Now, 
I suggest you prepare yourselves. Would you like a cup of tea? Use your voice. Use your body language. You're a hunched up old man. You're an innocent child looking up. You're a cowering kobold. You see, your players can see your face. They can see at least your upper body as you're sitting at a table. Use them. Go down, go up, get big, lean back, lean forward, change your voice, do all of these things as you portray your NPCs. It's not just about what you say, it's how you say it. Now, if you're not comfortable doing these things and it's out of your comfort zone, I would suggest that you push your comfort zone. Try it out. It will feel weird at first, but it almost always improves the game experience for your players. And the more you do it, the more natural it's going to feel. Number eight, fail forward. In my personal opinion, there should be no dead ends in a social interaction. Maybe the characters don't learn everything they could have learned from the Cobalt Slaves about the Orc Compound, but they don't get stuck. There should always be a way forward in the adventure. Like a dungeon. Imagine if there is a locked door linked to a puzzle, and if they can't solve the puzzle, it's impossible to move forward. You can't do anything. The game is over, the adventure is done, and you just tuck tail, go home, and get drunk at a tavern. I don't know. I mean, well, so what if they can't solve that puzzle? It, you know, that, that's just crap. That is an unsatisfying way to end an adventure and complete failure because you just couldn't come up with the right answer to that puzzle. And in the same way, social interactions shouldn't be game overs if the characters don't say just the right thing or the dice go against them. Number nine, use complications. Players often say the craziest of things in a social interaction. Hold them to it. Have your NPC react accordingly. Have there be appropriate consequences. Did they just insult the king to his face? Because <laughs> I don't know about you and your games, but my characters, my players' characters often say the wrong things to the wrong people intentionally. Okay, so they spend the night in jail and you know, they have some of their assets seized. The king decided that they don't need that tavern that they owned after all. It's now the king's tavern and tough luck, buddy, because he's the king. Now, sure, there's probably a way to get that tavern back, but it won't be easy. And the next time you're probably gonna take more care with your words, aren't you? You see, failing at something can often be the most fun part of the game because of the hot water and complications that can result. The same is true for social interactions. Number 10, involve all your players. Often you will find that a couple players will dominate a social interaction interaction and the others will mostly be quiet and that's no good. Pull them in, pull the quiet ones in, try to help them get involved as well. One of the best ways to do this is literally have your NPCs address them, perhaps with a question and draw them into the conversation. What about you? You've been quiet. Now bear in mind that there are different types of players. Some players aren't as active. Some players are just watchers, they're observers and they're content to be so. Other players want to be involved. They're the actors, they get involved and talk and do a lot of stuff. Stuff. It's okay for someone to be an observer and to be less involved if that's what they want, if that's what they prefer. But it could also be that they just can't get involved because these dudes over here won't stop talking. So the trick here is to invite them to engage, invite them to speak up and say their piece until you get a feel for their character type as a person. You don't wanna put them on the spot necessarily and make them feel uncomfortable when they are perfectly happy just listening, but you also want them to feel like they can get a word in if they want to. And so you need to quiet the other people down and invite them to interact as well with NPCs. Click on the screen now to learn about using animal sidekicks in your D&D game, or to become a DM Lair patron, get an issue of Lair Magazine every month and play D&D with me. And until next time, Tocino, 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 me encanta Tocino.